I was literally torn from watching Saturday morning cartoons and eating breakfast cereals with too much sugar in them to sitting in a school in the Soviet Union with porridge with like fish on it and stuff. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app or join our emailing list at coldwarconversations.com. Richard was six years old when he was uprooted from a school in the United States to a Soviet school 700 miles east of Moscow. In 1988, the Soviet Union was opening up following Mikhail Gorbachev's policy of perestroika and American firms began looking at the possibility of trading with the Soviet Union. It was a politically and economically sensitive time and his family were chosen to be sent to the USSR to open a factory in the industrial town of Nizhny Kamsk in Tatarstan. They lived in a special apartment building designated for foreigners and Richard attended the local school. Being thrown in the deep end of a Soviet school was a shock to him and he had to adapt fast, not least by learning Russian. He describes his school experiences and the stark contrast with his previous life. However, despite the difference, he found being a six-year-old in the Soviet Union was rather fun. There was a lunar park where they could go on rides, war-themed toys like tanks and soldiers, even at school, and all sorts of mischief was had. The battle to preserve Cold War history is ongoing and your support can provide me with the ammunition to continue to keep this podcast on the air. Via a simple monthly donation, you'll become one of our community and get a sought-after Cold War Conversations drinks coaster as a thank you and you'll bask in the warm glow of knowing that you're helping to preserve Cold War history. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If a monthly contribution is not your cup of tea, we also welcome one-off donations via coldwarconversations.com slash donate. I'm delighted to welcome Richard to our Cold War Conversation. I was born in, in Hertfordshire, uh, just north of London, about half an hour north. Um, and uh, my parents are from Stevenage. And so my father worked for an American firm, uh, an engineering company that had a factory just at the end of his mother's garden. So he would climb over the fence to to get to work. I think that's what attracted him to the place in the first place. Um, But, you know, from going climbing over the fence, uh, this brought us all over the world. And uh, we ended up in the Soviet Union and during the time of uh, Perestroika. Was your mother working at the time as well? Um, no, not at the time. She she, she had me quite young, and um, uh, she was a stay at home mum. So the the factory that your dad worked for, what what were they making? What was their business? Right. So it, it's an American firm. It was it was called Taylor Instruments, and they made um, all kinds of oh things like water pressure meters or control systems for chemical plants. Um, industrial engineering uh, stuff and my dad uh, who's kind of an engineer by background became a, a salesman uh, for that firm we as a family were invited to come over to Rochester in upstate New York so when I was quite young uh, we moved to to uh, to Rochester in New York and uh, we uh, have good memories of it and in 1986 uh, my sister was born in America. My dad traveled around the world quite a bit on business, uh, selling stuff. A lot of a lot of times in South Korea, for example, I remember it then. As the 80s got on and as the situation changed, there became this opportunity to, to uh, commence a joint venture with the Soviet finance ministry. And my dad was kind of ideally suited for it because... He already had quite a lot of international experience going to unusual parts of the world, dealing with industrial components and so on. And furthermore, because we weren't American citizens, well, we were green card holders. My sister's an American citizen. She was born there, but we weren't properly American. And uh, it it became easier, I believe, uh, to get us to go 
uh, to set up the factory in Russia and the Soviet Union. My, my dad had Russian lessons. Um, my parents were kind of briefed for what it all was all about. And eventually, I, I think it was 1988, uh, we found ourselves in a, an industrial city called Nishnikomsk, which is in a Tatar autonomous republic. It's now Tatarstan. It's part of Russia, but it's a region of Russia. A lot of ethnic Tatars there, about half the population. Um, and then basically Nishnikomsk was set up in the 1960s. And the whole point of this town was this vast petrochemical works in the center of the town. And I believe it's still the largest producer of synthetic rubbers and plastics and things like that in, 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 in Russia. And um, the job of uh, my dad's factory was to build control systems very much like the ones that were used in uh, from produced in the American factory and produced the same sorts of things uh, in Nishnikons for the purpose of using it there. So it was a very ambitious project. It was a lot of um, goodwill behind it. It was seen as real breaking new ground. There was a lot of positivity. I remember uh, everyone was given badges that had like the American flag crossed with the Soviet flag. Yeah, it was the first joint venture between the US and the Soviet Union. So it sounds like you, your dad had some preparation in terms of learning Russian and stuff like that. What sort of preparation did were you given or what were you N none at all told about the move? Absolutely nothing. Maybe I should maybe I would have benefited from something. But I was literally torn from um a sort of typical American uh suburban town. It wasn't even in Rochester proper. It was like it was a place just outside. A very pleasant place, by the way. Um, and, uh, yeah, basically one morning watching Saturday morning cartoons and eating breakfast cereals with too much sugar in them and uh, that sort of thing, going to McDonald's and having Happy Meals to uh, to sitting in a school in the Soviet Union with porridge with, like, fish on it and stuff. <laughs> Well, and I've had a look at Nishnikamsk on Google Earth, and it is, I mean, it's about 700 miles east of Moscow. I mean, it, it is deep into what was then the Soviet Union. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If my dad said at the time we're in the middle of nowhere, uh, it really felt it really felt isolated. And you can see the petrochemical plant on uh, Google Earth quite clearly. It it does look like it's in the middle of nowhere. How did you get there? Because I can't see any rail lines or anything from what I can see, or maybe there are. So as I recall, we were going back to uh, the UK often enough. And as I recall, you could fly between London and Moscow uh, on BA, I think even. I don't, I don't really remember. Or Aeroflot. Anyway, we flew into Moscow first, and sometimes we would have a quick look round in Moscow. And then there would be an internal flight, obviously, on Aeroflot from Moscow to Nishnikomsk. Um, um, to this day, there's a there's a there's a airport in Nishnikomsk because I remember passing through Istanbul what, recently and seeing on a departures board a flight to Nishnikomsk. <laughs> I thought that was unusual. But my dad said that I don't really remember this because Aeroflot flights were completely different from the Western Airlines I was using. The the Aeroflot flight, when it was approaching Nishnikomsk, they would ask you to put all the shutters down on the windows because they didn't want you to see everything because it was a like strategic uh, place. And it would sort of nosedive straight into the <laughs> into the airport. That's what my dad said about it. But the Aeroflots, Aeroflot flights were distinctly different. I remember, I remember that. Like There was no kind of um, Coca-Colas or anything. It was like carbonated water or still water or nothing, something like that. <laughs> Can you remember that first day when you arrive in Nishnikamps? I don't really remember it very well. We would have we would have arrived at a place that my dad had already kind of set up a bit. Yeah, but you were six years old at this point. Yeah, so as I recall, I was five or six. It would have been 1988, yeah. And what was Nishnikamps, the, the town, like? What, what did it have to... Uh... To offer, if I was to take that flight from Istanbul to there, what would you recommend me to go and see? Well, the, the, it's, it's probably got more going on now. In particular, the, the Tatar uh, ethnic group are able to express themselves more. I understand there's mosques and things. So I don't remember anything like that when I was there. 
But if you wanted to see an example of a sort of 1960s planned Soviet community, uh, this would be it. I mean, it had all of the sort of, um, it was all designed from scratch with nothing there previously. And it was designed to be in the, you know, highest form of sort of Soviet utopianism in terms of the the layout and the facilities and, and, and that sort of thing. M- big murals on the sides of the buildings, uh, palace of youth, um, lots of sports stuff. Um, reasonably well equipped, I, I imagine, by the standards of the time, but I, I, I don't have anything to compare it to. Where were you living? Were you in a an apartment block of some sort? Yeah, so from the outside, it looked like a typical apartment building that you might find anywhere. But there were other British people there to our surprise. So there was a construction company uh, that uh, sent skilled workers uh, to the Soviet Union. They had nothing to do with our family, but they were they happened to also be British. The fact that we were British is a coincidence because actually we were there representing Americans. Yeah, we were nominally Americans, although not, obviously not really. Um, the others there were were, were also British, um, and they all everyone else worked for the same firm. So basically, all foreigners were housed in this one building, right? At the top floor of this building, one of the empty flats was sort of converted into a social club or like a bar, and uh, that would be where everyone met, and hung out with each other, and things like that, because the town didn't really provide the same opportunities, and I I, I imagine. I imagine they didn't really want like a load of British guys <laughs> hanging around the town too much, but I don't know. Were there other children, other British children? Th- th- there were, but uh, as I recall, my sister and I were the only ones who attended local school, or in my sister's case, it's called Sajik. It's like the um, kindergarten, because she would have been like two or three years old. We were the only ones. The, I don't know what I don't know what kind of alternatives the other kids had. As far, as I recall, they were all quite young anyway. Uh, they wouldn't have been old enough to go into school that I went to. But I think my sister was the only one who, because she she attended the local kindergarten um, and has her own stories probably. But the the uh, yeah, uh, we we integrate we definitely integrated much more than the others did. About clothing, you, there were clothes shops. I'm presuming as well. We we um, mainly brought our own. Uh, I can't remember much apart from the school uniform of wearing local clothes, to be honest. It certainly taught us to probably habits that I still carry on today. It's like try and keep things a little minimal, try and not to overspend on, on, on things. At least I try not to, don't always succeed. Uh, aspire to, let's say. Um, I do think that most Western people have too much stuff, and I've always strived to keep it under control or minimal. Uh, those are things that I've brought away from there. At the time, it, yes, you weren't. There were uh, privations and stuff, but no one was starving, and it was just a bit more basic. That was all. And did during those two years, did you travel back to the UK at all, or were you there for? Yeah during school holidays and things uh, often enough I think for Christmas as well yeah Uh, often enough it wasn't as hard as you might imagine to to go from Hertfordshire to Nishnikomsk there were there were there were (laughs) not directly but there were there were ways to do it yeah just the the culture shock between going to and from and I guess you know if if you've got mates there you yeah as a young kid it's just the way it is you don't know that this is a bit odd well you know in those days I'll tell you something in those days when you went to a different country regardless of it, what side of the iron curtain it was on it felt like you were going to a different country I remember going to Spain when I'm in the 1980s it's a totally different place where I went where if you go there now like in, in the South, Costa del Sol, there's a town called Nerja, right? And there'd be um, sort of dry rolling hills with olive groves and things on and shepherds leaving goats around. And if you go there now, it's all just villas and holiday things. It's all We're all much more uh, homogenized now. So um, because we were traveling a lot anyway, um, I think um, it's easy to forget, like going to a different country really, even 
closer to Britain felt much more different than traveling around these days. So in that sense, America is totally different from the UK. UK is totally different from Spain. Um, Russia's again different. You know, it was more like that actually. Yeah. I mean, could you make phone calls from there to the UK? I guess they must have been able to contact the head office or something. Yeah, I think there were communications. I don't know how um, monitored they were, but um, yeah, and there was post as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure that that was available to us. Yes. Yeah, because people forget that. Because I remember traveling yeah. abroad in the 80s, and you you had no idea what was going on in the rest of the world during that fortnight <laughs> holiday, unless you bought a British newspaper or something like that. And yeah. You, you know, you didn't have internet. You didn't have. You couldn't access international TV channels in your hotel or or anything like that. It was it was quite nice, actually, because you just escaped completely. Yeah, it was like that. Um, a strange habit, I think, was sometimes my um, somebody would record, like, uh, some BBC news, and then like, the video would get passed around. It might be a couple of weeks old. <laughs> yeah, so and newspapers and things. So, um, yeah, in that sense, we were out of touch a bit. Um, but I don't feel like it was completely isolated. We weren't on a desert as an island or something. Did you have access to Western goods there, or did you have to buy uh, Soviet food and drink? So I mentioned there was a bar on the top of top floor of our building. Um, the the other British guys every six months, a lorry used to come from West Germany, I think, carrying mostly beer for the bar, right? But uh, it did have some other Western goods, um, toilet paper, some Coca-Cola, but very limited amounts of Western things. For sure, we had some. Uh, but uh, certainly in our case, the vast majority of our consumerism came from within the local things. Um, there was a hard currency shop. You're probably aware that all over uh communist eastern europe there was um, hard currency shops and our block had one that was open i don't know wednesday afternoons or something like that where you could pay for things in hard currency but i don't think we used it very often because the prices were like so inflated you know you could buy a kinder egg or something so in answer to your question yes we had some western goods certainly a lot more than anyone else would have locally but uh, by no means um did it represent a significant difference to the lifestyle? <laughs> Did your dad give you like pocket money in rubles to uh, he did spend? Um, even better, um, the ruble was officially pegged at one to the dollar or two to the dollar. I can't remember, but it was it officially it was it had a certain rate. Um, unofficially, of course, they were more or less worthless. So in our flat, there was a drawer absolutely full of rubles and my mum and dad said because i seem to remember i used to be able to go out on my own um with my friends and things but she said if you see anything feel free to buy it so it was like <laughs> you can imagine that uh, but but it didn't have um it there wasn't really much to buy and he kind of forgot that they were there um there was a lunar park where they had um rides like you know, you, you can imagine a, a Ferris wheel and some bumper cars and things or whatever like that. Um, and I remember there was an old vintage Aeroflot plane that you could kind of almost climb on. Um, and the the rides were there, and you, you could, but it was like 20 kopecks to go on a ride. So Peanuts. Less than peanuts. Yeah, yeah. Um, the only other things that I used to like spend my pocket money on is there was a green fizzy drink called uh tarhon i think it's called or targon and it's flavored with the herb tarragon right and any uh, anyone who spent time in this part of the world might recognize it it's so sort of bright green looks really artificially green but fizzy it's got quite a pleasant herbal taste to it and that was my favorite soft drink i used to quite like uh uh sunflower seeds which is quite a cliche um toy cars uh, I used to buy a lot of toy cars. There were there was a toy shop. It's very hit and miss what you'd find in there. I want to ask you about your your time in the school because that must have been an incredible contrast to your 
time in in the US. What can you remember that first day at school? Well, I do remember my parents taking me to meet the headmistress and she presented me with a toy gun, which I thought was great, but my parents were a bit uh, bemused by. Um it just happened to be a regular toy. In it, at the time, war toys and anything to do with like war was just standard like stuff. So um, I don't exactly remember the first day, but I do remember being surprised by this uh, topics that were constantly coming out. Like imagine a maths lesson, yeah, like basic uh, arithmetic or something. The examples might be tanks and bombs rather than in the capitalist world, it might be great. You go shopping and buy stuff. It was, I do remember things like that and the textbooks. I remember the paper of the feel of them and the illustrations of young pioneers and the posters on the wall of Lenin and other things. But I guess I was too young to take in the ideology or the propaganda or whatever, the imagery uh, too much, but I certainly, I certainly remember it being quite, quite aesthetically different uh, from what I was used to. Um, my memory of the school is it, the overwhelming feeling was of confusion because I didn't really speak Russian at first, although I did begin to learn it. The, I had no idea what was going on. The days went on and on and on where I was just sort of sitting there with an exercise book and a pen, basically drawing little pictures or something. So pretty hard, uh, pretty hard time. I, w- I wasn't a great fan of the kind of school. Other memories of the school were, um, the uniforms, which you might see in the photos, uh, which I've sent you, uh, there's a, the, the, they were quite um, quite smart looking, uh, almost like Air Force jackets, I guess, with patches on them. And there was a little Lenin badge where Lenin looked like a little boy uh, within a star. Um, I remember the uniforms. The school looked all right. Uh, the, I mean, physically, it looked fine. It had a dentist in it. That was a... Uh, so every now and again, you'd have to go and get your teeth checked. Um, what else? The, the the canteen, I didn't like the food at all, but I have an abiding memory and a great love of the bread. The bread had tremendously good flavor. And the, particularly, I liked having a crust. And the uh, tea, the, there would be gl- glasses of very strong tea, uh, which I don't know if that's appropriate nowadays to give to a six-year-old, but I loved it. And the tea was really great flavor without milk or anything, just strong black tea, but delicious. So that and the bread, um, which sounds, sounds austere, but I quite, I quite liked it at the time. Um, the sports facilities were incredibly big and advanced. There was a large gymnastics hall, and it had climbing ropes, trampolines, foam pits, um, every kind of thing like basketball or whatever, football. Really, um, it looked good in, from my memory, and it was it was pretty top of the range. Um, I think any British high, uh, school would be proud of this facility. You know, the Soviets always were trying to develop children into being sporty, weren't they? So that that would, I can see how that would work. Um, And I'm not a sporty person by inclination, but I did enjoy these sessions in this big gymnasium hall. How did your school mates react to your arrival in the class? We'll be back after a quick break. The fight to preserve Cold War history continues and via a simple monthly donation, you'll give me the ammunition to continue to preserve these incredible first-hand accounts. You'll become part of our community, you'll get the sought-after Cold War Conversations drinks coaster as a thank you and you'll bask in the warm glow of knowing that you're helping to preserve Cold War history. Just go to coldwarconversations.com or go to the link in the episode information. Uh, A lot of curiosity and most were welcoming and very nice to me. Yeah, they were friendly and positive, although um, in the playground, um, some of the boys were not so nice. Everyone used to shout Americanics at me, shout, thinking I was American. And that used to bother me as a young boy because 
they didn't know that I wasn't really American. Um, and some some older boys would like push me around or even trip me over and things like that. And one day I told my dad and he said, if anyone ever hits you, you have to hit them back. So the next time it happens, someone like pushed me or something or hit me. I punched him straight in the nose. We got into a fight, which I then won. And then all the like those lads um, respected me after that. So I was a lot sort of included more with them. So, so I had to, I couldn't be a wimp, you know, I had to, um, I had to defend myself. I think it would have made life a lot harder for myself if I didn't fight back. Uh, so yeah, it wasn't always as warm and nice as my immediate classmates were. Yeah. What about the girls? Were they intrigued by you? Well, yeah, but we were only six and we were all mixed in together. So it was, I don't think the reactions were so different. Uh, I remember they had these wonderful uniforms with big bows in their hair and the dresses are very striking. Um, but in terms of like reaction, I was too young to really pay attention to the differences. When I posted a photo of your class on um, social media, people were saying, wow, the bows that the girls have got in their hair. I mean, they're huge. Yeah, yeah, the, the classic school uniform. I mean, not everyone could just go around with a camera snapping pictures in those days like my mum did with her, you know, Kodak or whatever. So um, those pictures have become um, uh, of, uh, of interest uh, since since that time, yeah. No, absolutely. And what what sort of games were you playing in the playground? Was it football and stuff like that? Uh, yeah, occasionally we're kicking a ball around. Um, oh, I have to think back now. Uh, when I wasn't in punch ups, uh, I would have been the same as any other kids. Oh, we used to play a sort of version of ice hockey in the winter. When when like imagine a patch of ground freezes over, we were wearing snow boots. And we'd sort of knock a puck around a bit um, on on that. Ice hockey was it still is, I believe, a popular sport of Nishnikomsk. Uh, and in fact, the petrochemical factory were the main manufacturers of ice hockey pucks because that's the nature of the the things that they make. <laughs> you didn't uh, think to teach them British bulldog then, or anything like that. I should have, on reflection, shouldn't I? Yeah, um, I think there was enough. Uh, potential for violence as it was without introducing horseplay like that but yeah 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 I think (laughs) you're probably right there and in the 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 lessons so you mentioned that sort of like the political stuff sort of went over your head I guess you were too young for them to get too much into the ideology the ideology was more in the content of how they were teaching you subjects by the sound of it it was in the background on reflection, yeah, but um, I, I, I didn't know what capitalism was or communism was as such. For me, it was aesthetically different. There was a lot of Lenin, and there was a lot of like love Lenin and all this kind of stuff. Um, I found that a bit odd, but not enough to um, to sort of think too deeply into it, to be honest. I suppose the the, the most noticeable thing was the emphasis on war stuff. There was a lot of like I say, toys and illustrations and uh, stuff to do with that. It, it it was noticeable, but I didn't mind it because as, as a lad, uh, as, you know, I grew up with watching war films and playing with, with models and stuff. So I didn't really um, mind, but on reflection, that was, that was a noticeable um, characteristic. If I was counting tanks, I might have paid more attention in my maths lessons in the uh, in the UK. Well, there you go. Yeah. yeah, perhaps we missed a trick. Start of school, did you have to sing the national anthem or anything like that? Uh, I don't remember that. No, we did attend the, the Palace of Youth after school, but I don't remember much. And I don't think it made an impression on me. We were we were taken to cinema once or twice. It would have been some sort of Soviet film, but it just as easily could have just been some Soviet kids' films, which weren't always overtly, uh, you know, nationalistic. Frankly, I don't recall any of that. Or if I did, it didn't make an impression on me. America was much more like that. That's a good point, actually. Um, that's a huge thing I noticed about the states. Again, I'm not American, uh, but like all this standing up and doing the, the Pledge of Allegiance every morning, um, which I sat out on. 
and like going to sports games and seeing the national anthem sung over there. I would say that was more of a characteristic of the USA than it was uh, being in uh, Nishnikovsk. So out, outside of school, it sounds like there were some after school activities. Can you just describe some of the after school activities? A lot of it went on at this Palace of Youth, I think it was called. I, I just do remember like having such a long day at school, just wanting to go home. And sometimes I just I just went home, yeah, of my own volition, yeah. And um, the teachers and my uh, classmates, they would say, why didn't you come to this? Why didn't you come to this? So it wasn't obligatory, but it was like strongly encouraged that you go. But I just had enough. School would go on until it got like from it's dark in the morning to when it's dark at night uh, in the winter. That was you, would, you know, it was a really long day. It felt like it anyway. So um, when not trying to go to the dodging the palace of youth, um, my friends, I did have my, I did meet friends after school, and we used to go up to all sorts of mischief. So there was a um, I don't know who introduced it or who got it, but there was a, uh, basically pages of pieces of newspaper was soaked in a chemical. Once that dried, you would wrap it in some foil and you would light the end and it would go up into the sky like a rocket, like a, like a small firework. Looking back on it, it's amazing no one blew their hands off. You know, this is us messing around with chemicals. It must have been some kind of fertilizer, like uh, saltpeter or something like that, or ammonium. I don't know enough about chemistry, but I can only imagine it was some sort of fertilizer chemical but I currently live in Poland and I asked my Polish father-in-law about this and he said they used to do it here as well. So um, if I wonder if any of any of your listeners ever lived in Eastern Europe ever encountered this. But yeah, that was a game we stupidly used to play. Um, where there was a lot of things like snowball fights and building bases. And uh, I wasn't, strictly speaking, supposed to bring other lads home by order of the building management so as i explained we lived in a building specially for foreigners um, and at the reception there were these uh, ladies who kind of monitored who was coming in and out they could well have been kgb who knows um but uh i used to smuggle a couple of my mates in and as long as i could get them in my mum would uh welcome them and look and host them yeah so one tactic we had was like my winter coat was uh from america so it was quite colorful almost like a shell suit jacket and um they wore sort of plain colored ones and we would just swap our clothes around so that the uh receptionist couldn't couldn't uh, know who was coming in or they may have turned a blind eye but once i got them in my mother used to bake them cookies and we'd watch tom and jerry videos because uh, we had a television and a video machine, but you know, I guess I guess Soviet TV was of limited interest to our family, so we had quite a large collection of videos, and so so did other people in the in the building. So it's like basically it was a big library, um, and there were children's videos. Tom and Jerry was their favourite, and if you recall, Tom and Jerry doesn't really have any dialogue. Yeah, it's just the animals running around. So um, that was the one. That, used to get put on and my mum would make them sandwiches and biscuits and stuff so yeah they yeah that was that was after school uh for the most part how long did it take you to learn sufficient russian to be able to communicate effectively well i don't remember when when i became able to communicate in russian from when not being able to but i knew i was able to one day when my mum took me out to the market to buy some vegetables or something. And she was trying to uh, understand the price. And then I just sort of stepped in and uh, acted as the interpreter. And I thought, oh, I can speak Russian now. That was the moment of realization. Yeah, because, you know, we used to go shopping and there was like some limited free market, like uh, smallholders were allowed to trade in a market hall. Uh, but it was mostly like seasonal vegetables. Um, you know, in the supermarkets, there was a lot of birch syrup. Um, uh, I don't know. <laughs> we were consuming local goods. Bread was always good. The one thing they did really well was the bread. Um, and uh, yeah, I used to go out shopping with my mum. 
and uh, speak Russian. I don't. I don't remember when the moment came when it was like black and white, but that was. It, it happened quickly. Children learn fast. You're at school during the day, so you've got. You know, you're you're more occupied. But how how did your mother, for example, deal with her time? Uh, she she struggled. Yeah, because um, uh, there were other mums in the building, but there wasn't a hell of a lot for her to do. Uh, apart from you know she had my sister and me my dad was away a lot working so there was just uh, the other mums in the building I think and um, I guess she was trying to um, figure out what to cook with this with whatever ingredients was at hand austere I think it was for my mum because you know my dad had his social life with the guys um, and his handlers and whatever but um, I think she had the worst time out of it yeah, I mean, did they did this block have a library as well, or books, or anything like that? Not, no, not formally. Informally, of course, everyone uh, swapped stuff. Um, yeah, like people wrote their names on videos and things, uh, but um, not not exactly. No, there was a small community, it, it, not too organised though. How about at, at weekends? Did you? travel to any other towns or or any other locations sometimes as i recall we didn't really travel far uh, sometimes we'd go on a day trip um to like maybe a lake and have a swim or some beautiful forest or the scenery was could be quite nice um my father had a black volga car which stood out because normally the only people who drive black volga cars are like party nomenclature or um senior people or or kgb or something like that so um when he was driving around people sort of noticed and pay attention to it um he also had a motorcycle and sidecar uh, which was based on this world war ii german design uh, but they made them in russia afterwards and so we had fun like going on little drives uh, around also sometimes you might hear a rumor that in a nearby place, something was available. So we'd go drive out and have a look, um, mainly just to check like for the sake of it as much as anything else. But yeah, we used to go on little day trips. Um, all the banya. Uh, so my dad and his friends used to go to this bathhouse of banya. Um, and I, I, I even got taken there a few times. And they would sort of sit around and eat and drink and uh in the winter roll around in the snow which is quite a spectacle so uh that was another activity the guys used to do but then again not much for the ladies or well, not much for my mum anyway so this was like a sauna the banya yeah yeah russian style which is, is quite sociable and um uh, yeah very, very much typical of russian culture when you were out with your your soviet school friends i mean you said you got up to mischief there must be more mischief than what you're letting on here oh be trying to get into places we weren't meant to be getting into and uh oh goodness knows what else it's just uh, just a bunch of lads roaming around but we were very young i think the explosive newspaper was probably the worst and your parents were comfortable with you just roaming as long as you were back at a certain time i guess Looking back at the fair amount of freedom, I guess it was, apart from any trouble we got in ourselves, it was relatively safe. Um, that's an advantage it has uh, over other places. But um, I do remember going out to the shops on my own and picking up stuff. Uh, I do remember going out with my friends, especially to the Lunar Park. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, it wasn't so terrible in that sense at all. There was there was quite a lot of uh, trust and freedom in us to go off and do our thing. And how how much did the did the teachers take to you? I mean, what what was their attitude? Was it just another school kid, albeit one that can't speak Russian initially? No, um, I think I, I regret uh, now misbehaving quite as much as I did because I found it like confusing or boring or uh frustrating or whatever misunderstand things um because i think my teacher did have a hard time with me um and she didn't quite know what to do with me and i also think she felt under pressure 
because she was told, look, you're getting this kid here who's, you know, representing an American father's factory or whatever. Um, make sure he's settled in. So I, th- I think she w- she must have been stressed by the whole thing, let alone with my belligerence or whatever. With the, <laughs> I wasn't a very – I've never been a very scholarly kid. I've never fit in very well with schools, let alone the Soviet one. Yeah, I do regret I do regret giving her a hard time. I guess a lot of extremes of temperature there between winter and summer. Oh, for sure, it's very much four seasons uh, place, um, and the food would reflect that. They very seasonally, as we do here in Poland, by the way. I mean, the, we you know we we eat um, fresh asparagus or. Uh, young cabbage and well whatever's going on in the right season same story there um so you could only get tomatoes sometimes yeah uh the minus temperatures got pretty low and i had a big furry ushanka as did everyone else and uh yeah in the summer it would be the opposite scorching hot although i think we normally left during the summer holidays to go back to england very much a four seasons place yeah when you think back to that time there, have you got a particular fondest memory or or something that you you found particularly enjoyable? I I liked I like the aesthetics of it. I liked tall buildings now, and I like the I used to collect the enamel badges and the little tin tanks and the uh, um uh, for for many years I have a very positive image of the aesthetics of of that place and uh, i still read you know i still have a few little odds and ends from from the time like a little pair of binoculars and um i've got a compass like a watch uh, that, that tells you direction and um yeah just fond memories it's hard to pick a fix, pick a fix one but overall uh, i have a positive impression of my time there Although, you know, we were in a privileged position, but uh, so I understand that it wasn't typical for everyone. But uh, in terms of what I saw and the people I met, um, it was it was it was good. And, you know, when it came to uh, leaving, it was quite sudden. And I uh, we, we, we went back to the US um, and uh, for a while I missed it, actually. Why? Why uh, did you leave? You know what? What was the reason for uh, leaving in the end? Well, it was partly to do with my dad's employer. Um, they got bought by a, another company, and he didn't like the new management. Uh, he didn't like the new. I don't know the details, but he didn't like the corporate culture at all. And furthermore. Um, he became suspicious that the management of the factory were not entirely being honest. He didn't feel like everything was being fully done legitimately. So he, combination of reasons, I guess my mother was also very fed up with it. Um, we left uh, back to Rochester, New York. Wow. That must have been a hell of a story to tell your schoolmates when you uh, got back to Rochester. Well they, well, they didn't believe me. They didn't believe me. No, they thought I was making it up. Um, when I said I'd been living in the Soviet Union. It's about 1990 by this point. Yeah, so I, I think I soon adapted back to life in the States because it, that's a, I mean, that part of that era was a lovely time and it was a lovely place where we were in upstate New York. Um, shopping, of course, came back. So I strongly believe there's pros and cons to both places in our lives, you know, and uh, I, I, I feel I benefited from both living in the Soviet Union and living in the USA. And not many British kids have the opportunity to compare them. Yeah, I mean, an incredible experience. You're also away in the depths of Russia. You know, you are a long way away from the main urban centres. And so you're experiencing a life and a lifestyle, albeit you've got some privileges there that very few people from the UK or even the US would have experienced. Yeah. Now it sounds totally desolate in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Um, but there were many positive and good things about that town. 
not least, I mentioned um, the sports facilities and the, the, the school in general. I think a lot of Western schools would would like would love to have this uh, uh, facilities that they had, and the, the education was, um, as I understand from, um, from uh, talking to people later, that it was it was technically good. Like the the people became qualified and uh, they got some good. They got some good skills and become highly professionals. Not only in Russia, a lot of them emigrated. So um, the schooling was good. Uh, the sense of friendliness and safety of the community was good. Uh, the, um, you didn't see uh, unemployed people or homeless people, right? Although, of course, we lived in flats. But when I walk around London today and I see like rows of tents in the streets and all sorts of social problems, um, I'm not saying they had all the perfect dancers, but they certainly didn't have the same kinds of problems as as as, as modern Western cities have. I'm not naive, uh, and I and I think that you know it had its own flaws, but um, I don't think it's everything's black and white. Are you in contact with any of your uh, old schoolmates? Yes. Um, so. Um, I through Facebook, uh, I posted um, a picture on one of these kind of Soviet nostalgia groups, and uh, uh, someone, got, one of my classmates, got in touch, and we had a lovely conversation. He now lives in South Korea, obviously speaks good English now, and we, we, we we've had a lovely old uh, chat and catch up. And I asked him many questions about my time there, and um, he put me in touch uh, with other classmates that you might see in the photos. Not all of them can speak uh, English. Some of them can, but I've had I, I, my Russian is almost all but gone. Um, so uh, we've, we have to communicate using like Google Translate. Uh, but yeah, I'm still in touch with them, and they've all got quite varied lives. You know, they all do different things now and in different countries. So yeah, you say you know you think of Nizhnykomsk as this m- middle of nowhere place, but it did seem to. It did seem to produce some quite talented people, at least. Well, I do recommend people just look up uh, Nishni Camps on uh, Google Maps because you can take a little bit of a tour and you can see this architecture, this 60s architecture. It looks like almost like a little bit of a time capsule from, uh, you know, when, when you were there. Yeah, I, I'm sure that I'm sure that the locals would, would love to highlight how many modernizations they've been since then. Don't miss the episode extras such as videos, photos and other content. Just look for the link in the podcast information. The podcast wouldn't exist without the generous support of our financial supporters and I'd like to thank one and all of them for keeping the podcast on the road. If you'd like to help the project, just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. The Cold War Conversation continues in our Facebook discussion group. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thanks very much for listening and see you next week. Thanks for listening right through to the end. I really appreciate it. And maybe check out our store and see if you can find the ideal gift for the Cold War enthusiast in your life. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash store. Thanks for listening.